have some Republicans at a leadership election, but they'll be coming in. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Is it working? Well, the election is over. They're still counting the votes and making legal challenges. And once all the legal challenges are made and the votes are counted, uh, we'll have that done. We've still got two outstanding races uh, in Georgia to determine the control of the Senate. Uh, and the committee will keep moving forward doing its work. We have next week uh, social media oversight. I can't wait to have the uh, social media CEOs come to the committee and explain themselves about their platforms. So that's November the 17th. And I think there's a lot of bipartisan support uh, to take a hard look at social media platforms. Uh, the Earn It Act is um, still a business pending for the committee. And after the hearing, we'll, we'll have a markup. But today we have Mr. McKay is the uh, number two at the FBI during Crossfire Hurricane. I think he's going to appear um, remotely. So I appreciate him coming. And uh, what I'll do is make a brief opening statement. Crossfire Hurricane has been looked at in many fashions. The Inspector General's report found 17 policy violations. Uh, regarding the way the crossfire hurricane um, operation was performed. The FISA court uh, basically rebuked the FBI and the Department of Justice regarding the warrant application um, made against Carter Page. Every person that we've talked to, been able to get a hold of, has said, if I knew then what I know now, I would not have signed the Carter Page warrant application. We'll take that topic up with Mr. McCabe. And counterintelligence investigations of political people, the committee needs to look long and hard at creating some new rules of the road. This won't be the last time foreign governments try to interfere in our election. And the Russians did, for sure try to interfere in the 2016 election. We'll see what happened in 2020. But also, you got to make sure that those involved in investigating campaigns have a even hand about it and that whatever biases they have don't seep into the system so that one candidate gets treated differently than the other. And we're going to talk about that today with Mr. McKay, that every allegation of a campaign being involved with foreign entities or trying to create an impression of involvement with foreign entities needs to be looked at, not just one side of the ledger. And I um, look forward to asking Mr. McCabe, did, did the FBI live up to that when it came to Crossfire Hurricane? And try to find out how the system got so off the rails when it came to Mr. Page and the warrant application. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Senator Feinstein. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your comments on the election. I think we all should be heartened by the record participation and the dedication of our poll workers and state election officials, and certainly on this side of the aisle, and I hope on the other side too, uh, in the results. Um, so, we thank you for calling this hearing. Uh, it's part of your examination of Crossfire Hurricane, and that's the FBI investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. Uh, Special Counsel Mueller took control of that investigation when he was appointed in 2017. He concluded that there was foreign interference in the 2016 election. He found that Russia interfered, quote, in sweeping and systematic fashion, end quote. He also uncovered numerous contacts between members of the Trump campaign and individuals linked to Russia. And he determined that the campaign knew about, welcomed, and, quote, expected it would benefit electorally, end quote, from Russia's interference. 
the Senate Intelligence Committee, on which I sit, confirmed Mueller's findings in a bipartisan report. The report details Russia's 2016 interference and how Trump campaign members were involved. That includes campaign manager Paul Manafort, whose ties to Russia made him, in the committee's words, quote, a grave counterintelligence threat. These investigations make clear that the FBI was right to investigate Russian election interference and the Trump campaign's ties to Russia. Inspector General Michael Horowitz also confirmed that the FBI was right to investigate. After a two-year investigation, he concluded that the FBI was justified in opening Crossfire Hurricane and that there was no evidence that the political bias impacted the Bureau's work. None of the 14 witnesses the committee has heard from during the chairman's investigation have provided evidence to the contrary. So where are we? More than four years have passed since the FBI opened Crossfire Hurricane and multiple investigations have confirmed that the FBI was correct to do so. So I think, Mr. Chairman, it's time to turn the page on Crossfire Hurricane. I'm grateful to FBI Director Ray and the career men and women of the FBI who worked hard to secure our country and its elections. They include FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, who I look forward to hearing from today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Is Mr. McCabe, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me, Senator? Mr. McCabe. Hello, Senator, can you hear me? Could you speak up, please, sir? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Uh, sorry, Hello? we're not getting any sound. Uh, Bear with let's us, see. Mr. McCabe. We'll see if we can fix this. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, thank yeah. you very much, very much. Okay. Loud and clear, please. Uh, could you raise your right hand? Raise yes, your right sir. Hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you about give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you're gone? I do. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Would you like to say anything? Would you, or are you just? Uh, sure? Yes, sir, I have an opening statement that I would like to read. Please, go ahead. Okay. Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Feinstein, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. I had the privilege to serve as an FBI agent for over 21 years, from my first assignment working Russian organized crime in New York City to the last years I spent as deputy director at FBI headquarters. I worked with the greatest people on earth, men and women who have dedicated their lives to protecting the country as agents, analysts, and professional staff members of the FBI. I know FBI people as hardworking, dedicated patriots who are committed to the rule of law above all else. The jobs are hard, sometimes dangerous, and often they are pushed beyond the limits of their experience into volatile, unpredictable situations. FBI personnel are not perfect, but when they make mistakes, they submit to the rigors of oversight and remain committed to learning and getting it right the next time. I was honored to be one of them. I was honored to lead them, and I am honored to discuss our work today. I've agreed to testify today about my knowledge of events related to the U.S. Department of Justice Office of the Inspector General report entitled Review of Four FISA Applications and Other Aspects of the FBI's Crossfire Hurricane Investigation and the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Because I was not permitted to consult the documents that may have refreshed my memory, to include my personal notes and my calendar, I may not be as precise and accurate as I otherwise would be. 
I appreciate the committee's flexibility in conducting this hearing virtually rather than in person. While I continue to believe an in-person appearance is a better vehicle for a fair and vigorous oversight hearing, the current status of the COVID-19 pandemic compels me to be extremely cautious about where I go and what I do. My wife is a frontline first responder who takes care of children and their families in our local emergency room. I try to avoid unnecessary chances of potential exposure that might put her at risk and possibly endanger her ability to continue caring for our community. In July of 2016, the FBI initiated an investigation codenamed Crossfire Hurricane to determine whether an individual or individuals from the Trump presidential campaign might be coordinating with the Russian government to interfere with our 2016 presidential election. The concerns that led to our initiation of this case are well known. In the fall of 2014, the FBI had begun tracking cyber actors affiliated with Russia who were targeting U.S. political institutions, academic think tanks, and other entities. In the spring of 2016, this activity intensified as new Russian cyber actors invaded computer networks at the Democratic National Committee. At the time, we did not know what they planned to do with the information they were stealing from the DNC, but soon we found out. In July 2016, Russian intelligence agents, acting through the online alias Guccifer 2.0, published hundreds of thousands of emails and other information stolen from the DNC with the intent of damaging Hillary Clinton on the eve of the Democratic National Convention. This malicious use of stolen information signaled a new level of hostility directed at the heart of American democracy. Several months before this release, and unknown to the FBI at that time, a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign, George Papadopoulos, informed a diplomat from a friendly foreign government that the Trump campaign had, quote, received indications from the Russian government that it could assist the campaign through the anonymous release of information that would be damaging to Hillary Clinton, close quote. It was only after the DNC information was publicly released in July that the diplomat communicated the content of his conversation with Papadopoulos to the United States government. So what did we know in July 2016? Well, we had known for almost two years that the Russians were targeting our political institutions in cyberspace. By the spring of 2016, we knew the Russians had stolen information from the DNC. By July, we knew the Russians had used that information in a manner designed to hurt Hillary Clinton's chances in the election. And then we learned that before the Russians attacked us, an individual from the Trump campaign may have known the attack was coming. FBI policy sets the threshold for opening a full field investigation as the moment when you have information or articulable facts that indicate a threat to national security might exist or that a federal crime might have been committed. In July of 2016, we had both. Russian intelligence services attacking our democratic process, possibly in coordination with the presidential campaign. We opened a case to investigate and try to mitigate that threat and to find out what the Russians might have done. Let me be very clear. We did not open a case because we liked one candidate or didn't like the other one. We did not open a case because we intended to stage a coup or overthrow the government. We did not open a case because we thought it might be interesting or because we wanted to drag the FBI into a heated political contest. We opened a case to find out how the Russians might be undermining our election. We opened a case because it was our obligation and our duty to do so. We did our job. DOIG's review of four FISA applications and other aspects of the FBI's Crossfire Hurricane investigation details a significant number of errors and failures related to the FISA applications in this case. I agreed to be interviewed in connection with the IG's investigation, and I have reviewed the report. I was shocked and disappointed at the errors and mistakes that the OIG found. To me, any material misrepresentation or error in a FISA application is unacceptable, period. The FBI should be held to the standard of scrupulous accuracy that the court demands. FISA remains one of the most important tools in our country's efforts 
to protect national security. The FBI is the custodian of that tool. I fully support every effort to ensure the FBI's use of FISA maintains the high standards that the court and the American people demand and deserve. This commitment to the rule of law, acknowledging our mistakes and doing everything possible to ensure that they are corrected, well, these are the reasons I am here today. They are the same reasons I have cooperated fully with every interview, hearing, and oversight effort requested of me, both while I served and since I've left the FBI. I have provided testimony to four different congressional committees on these and related matters. I've been interviewed in connection with the special counsel's investigation, as well as three separate DOJ OIG investigations, submitting to questioning and reviewing documents over the equivalent of seven full business days. In an effort to provide this committee with the most complete, accurate testimony possible, I requested the FBI allow me to review some of my former materials, including my calendars and personal notes. That request was denied. Fortunately, the broad scope of these matters and the passage of time makes many of the details of our work hard to remember. I will do my best to answer your questions today, but I will not speculate or guess about details and facts that now remain beyond my reach without the benefit of refreshing my recollection. Based on the recent testimony of the current FBI director and other intelligence officials, it seems that many of the same signs of malevolent Russian targeting that, we, that concerned us in 2016 were seen in the run-up to the election we just completed. As both a former career law enforcement officer and a senior intelligence officer, uh, stress Mr. In Mr. McKay, uh, you had a five-minute opening statement. We're at eight minutes and 40 seconds. Could you please wrap up? Yes, sir. I cannot stress enough the importance of focusing your efforts and the attention of this nation on the dangers of foreign influence on our election. The Russians were successful beyond their wildest imagination in accomplishing their goals in 2016. Their successes serve as an encouragement to other hostile nations intent on undermining our security, safety, and stability. The Russians and others will be back. Please do not let the recent calm of the 2020 election lure the nation into a false sense of security. It is up to you to ensure the nation recognizes the magnitude of the threat posed by foreign actors and takes sufficiently aggressive steps to address it. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. For the record, before I begin my questioning, one of the reasons that he's not able to review its notes is that the FBI did not want him to have access to classified information. I promised Mr. McKay we would not go into the details of his dismissal but I don't want anybody to have the belief that this committee chose for him not to have access. It was his former employer who made that decision. Uh, now, very quickly, did anyone from the Trump campaign wind up being prosecuted for colluding with the Russians? Senator, it's my understanding the results of the Mueller investigation that no one was prosecuted for criminal conspiracy involving um, that activity would, with the That Russians. would include Mr. Papadopoulos, is that correct? Uh, Mr. Papadopoulos, to the best of my recollection, was prosecuted for making false statements right. to FBI agents. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Let's make sure that the FBI treated both sides fairly. Um, Senator Feinstein suggested it was right to open up the investigation against the Trump campaign. You say it was right. It was your duty. Let's look at uh, the entire record of the 2016 election and see how even handed the FBI was. On September the 7th, 2016, the CIA, now not the uh, Australian ambassador of the U United Kingdom in London, but our CIA sends an investigative lead over to the FBI. And they informed the FBI of U.S. presidential candidate Hillary Clinton's approval of a plan concerning U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump and Russian hackers hampering U.S. elections as a means of distracting the public from her use of a private mail service. How many agents were assigned to investigate that? Uh, 
Senator, if you are referring to the memorandum, the raw intelligence memorandum recently declassified by the DNI. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have read that memorandum and I, I, I don't understand it to be a request for investigative activity. Uh, I'm not aware that any agents were uh, assigned to investigate the information. Wait a minute. That Wait a minute. Time out. It. Time out. You get an, you get a memo, an investigative lead is what the CIA calls it, alleging that Hillary Clinton had just signed off on a plan to tie Trump to Russia for political purposes. How many people looked at that? How many agents were assigned to see if it was true or not? Did well, you know Senator, about it? Did you know about it? Uh, I was not aware of that memorandum. Wait until a minute. Time out. I, time yeah. out. Time out. You get a CIA memo, investigative lead memo, suggesting that the Democratic candidate for president, Hillary Clinton, is trying to divert attention from her email server problem by casting aspersions against the Trump campaign being connected to Russia, and you didn't know about it. How is that possible? Senator, I'd like to explain to you uh, how that's possible. Who did um, it go George to? Who did it go to? I will. I, will. I just want to make sure if he understands sure. who it went to. Who did the memo go uh, to? I, I recently, I read the memo recently, and my understanding it went to the to Director Comey and was also to the attention of Peter Strzok. Um, that memorandum that you're referring to, as I read it, is in response to an FBI request, oral request, for an update of the sort of information that the Crossfire uh, Hurricane Task Force was reviewing about Russian uh, activity in the campaign. That's from my best recollection. That's well, what the I, I'm third here paragraph to, I'm here says. to tell you that that's not what happened is that the CIA, and we've got the documents, sent to the FBI information suggesting that Hillary Clinton had approved of a plan to link Donald Trump to Russia for political purposes, and it went to Peter Strzok. Do you believe Peter Strzok was fair-minded when it came to the Trump campaign? Um, Senator, my experience is working with Peter Strzok. Uh, yes, I believe he was fair in the decisions that he made and the work that he did. So do you object to Mueller relieving him from the investigation because of the emails show that he hated Trump's guts? Um, my recollection, sir, is that uh, we removed Peter from that team. Uh, because did, of the ongoing did, investigation did, into Did you his, remove him or uh, did Mueller remove him? Uh, we had conversations uh, on the evening that I was first shown the text messages between Mr. Strzok and Ms. Page, and we made the decision to remove him, and we reached out to uh, right. Director right. Mueller's team, and they agreed with that. That's my recollection. So you believe that Peter Strzok was on the up and up. Were you ever... Was it ever suggested to you by Mr. Precept that Mr. Strzok should not be involved in this investigation because of his relationship with Lisa Page? Uh, Senator, to um, I remember discussing with um, both Mr. Precept and Mr. Steinbach. Um, so here's probably the, here, in well, here are the here are the facts. Precept suggest that Strzok not be involved, you overrode him. And here's what we know about Strzok and Page. Page, March 3rd, 2016. God, Trump is a loathsome human. Oh my God, Strzok, Trump's an idiot. He's awful, Strzok. God, Hillary should win 100 million to nothing. August, 2016, Page, he's not ever going to become president, right? Strzok. No, no, he won't. We'll stop it. So is it your testimony under oath that you think Peter Strzok <clears throat> had no biases against Trump? Senator, it is my testimony under oath that the work that I saw Peter Strzok do on the Crossfire case and on other cases Why did didn't not he tell you indicate any 
Go ahead. Senator, I, I'm having a hard time finishing an answer. Uh, I don't know if please, it's please finish. connection please or finish. what. But please finish. So I was simply stating that the work that I saw Peter do uh, on this case and other cases, from that work and the decisions he made, I did not see any indications of political bias. Did you? Can, did how you? do you explain to the American people that when the FBI received a memo from the CIA alleging that Hillary Clinton had signed off on a plan concerning U.S. Presidential Donald Trump and Russia hackers hampering U.S. elections as a means of distracting the public from our use of a private mail service that you did nothing. Should Peter Strzok have told you about this? I can't explain to you, Senator, what Peter Strzok or Director Comey thought about that memo at that time. Should you have been noted? Uh, what, I can, what I can say, Senator, wait a is that... No, wait a minute. No, no, the- please, please. I want to get into this. Everybody is saying that you had the right to open up an investigation against Trump based on the U.S. ambassador, the, excuse me, the Australian ambassador to the United Kingdom who heard a conversation in a bar. What you're telling this committee when the CIA informs the FBI about a plan signed off by Hillary Clinton to link Trump to Russia, nothing was done. Is that what you're saying? There was no investigation of that allegation at all. What I'm saying, sir, Senator, is it is not clear to me that there is an allegation of criminal conduct in that memorandum. That is based on my current reading of it. I did not it, see it at the it, time. It, I can't it, tell it's you what not, others thought. A counterintelligence investigation is what was opened up against Trump, not a criminal investigation. Is that true? Papadopoulos was a counterintelligence investigation. Uh, the case against Mr. Papadopoulos was a counterintelligence case. So if you're going to have a counterintelligence investigation opened up against the Trump campaign based on a conversation by the Australian ambassador to the United Kingdom based on a bar conversation, you're telling me that's legit and you put all the resources for two and a half years to run that down. But you're telling this committee when our own CIA suggests that Hillary Clinton signed off on a plan to link Trump to Russia for political purposes, you didn't do a damn thing. Is that your testimony? No, sir. That's not my testimony. Well, what happened? My testimony, uh, I'm happy to explain to you how we thought about the issue with Mr. Papadopoulos. No, that's not my question. No, my question is... Why did the FBI not open up an investigation based on the CIA input? The CIA is telling the FBI that they have information that Hillary Clinton signed off a plan to deflect attention for her and put uh, Trump in a bad light regarding Russia. That came in September 2016. You didn't know about it, apparently. Can you explain to this committee and the American people why the FBI did nothing regarding that allegation? I cannot, sir, explain to you what Peter Strzok or anyone else thought about that at the time. But I can explain to you that the information in that memo. I I accept that you believe that Mr. Papadopoulos should be looked at. I'm not arguing with you. I don't understand how you can tell how the FBI operated. You've got a tip from a Australian ambassador, the United Kingdom, talking about a bar conversation with Mr. Papadopoulos about Russia hacking, and that leads to two and a half years of turning the country upside down. Your own CIA informs the FBI in September that they have information that Hillary Clinton herself signed off on a plan to divert attention from her email problems to Trump by linking him to Russia for political purposes. And Mr. Strzok never told you about it. The FBI never opened up an investigation. They never hired one agent. That really is disturbing to a lot of us. Now, let's go to the warrant. In June 2016, excuse me, 2017, did you sign off on the Carter Page warrant application? In June of 2016, yes. 17, I'm sorry. 17, I'm sorry. 2017. Okay. Did you know at the time that the CIA had uh, warned the FBI on numerous occasions to be careful using the dossier? It was Internet rumor. I did not know that at the time, and I'm, I don't know that now. Okay. Well, we got a list of, uh, let's see, list of CIA informs the FBI that 
FBI that Carter Page had approved, had been approved as an operational contact from 2008 to 2013. Did you know that the CIA had told the FBI that in August of 2017? No, sir. The reason that's important, that would explain why Mr. Page was actually talking to people he claimed to be talking with. Uh, did you know, um, did you have a conversation with Mr. Orr about the reliability of Christopher Steele? I had a conversation in October of 2016 about, with Mr. Orr about his interactions with um, Mr. Steele. Did he tell you you should be concerned and be careful? I don't remember him saying I should be concerned or be careful, no. In the fall of 2016, this is his testimony to the committee. You put Mr. Cabe on notice. Hey, you need to watch this. You need to verify. I certainly gave him the same caveats, and the caveats were that Steele hated Trump. Yes, your concerns. Yes. What did, what did he say when you told him that you were concerned about you need to be careful for lack of a better term? I think he understood because he also worked on Russia criminal matters. So we have Mr. Orr under oath saying that he expressed concerns to you, Strzok, and others about the reliability of Mr. Steele. You don't remember that? Senator, I don't remember the specifics of our conversation. However, we were engaged in trying to determine um, and verify the statements in Mr. Steele's reporting at that time. So we okay. were certainly concerned yeah. about were, those things. Were, were you aware of the subsource interview in January and March to the FBI? I was aware that uh, an individual who our team thought of as uh, a, one of the primary subsources had been identified and that they were interviewing. Did they tell you about the Did substance of those interviews? Uh, not in detail. So... You didn't know that in January, the subsource tells the FBI he had no idea where some of the language attributed to him came from. His contacts never mentioned some of the information attributed to them. He said he did not know the origins of other information that was supposedly from his contacts. He did not recall other information attributed to him or his contacts. Still used incorrect source characterizations, characterizations for the primary subsource's contacts. Uh, that in March he said he never expected to Steele to put his statements in reports or present them as facts. The statements were word of mouth and hearsay conversations had with friends over beers or statements made in jest that should be taken with a grain of salt. Was any of that ever communicated to you? Uh, no, sir, not that I can recall. If you knew then what you know now, would you have signed the warrant application in June of 2017 against Carter Page? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Finally, who is responsible for ruining Mr. Carter Page's life? If it's not you, if it's not Rosenstein, if it's not Comey, if it's not Sally Yates, who's responsible for putting together the information provided to the FISA court that was completely devoid of the truth, lacking material facts, completely represented what Mr. Page did and how he did it, who should we look to for that responsibility? Well, sir, I, I don't agree with the way that you've characterized the entirety. That's what the court of, said. Um, I, I think as the IG pointed out in the conclusions of their report, Who's that, responsible, Mr. You know, McKay? Everyone who had, every person who Everybody's played a responsible. Role. Nobody's responsible. Sir, it would help if you'd allow me to finish my answer. I think it might be uh, easier to understand. Okay. The question is who's responsible. Are, and I think that we are all responsible for the work that went into that FISA. I am certainly responsible as a person in a leadership position with oversight over these matters. I accept that responsibility fully. Uh, did you um, mislead, the, did you mislead the FISA court? Uh, I signed a package that included uh, numerous factual errors or failed to include information that should have been brought to the court. And what, and, should, be um, done, what should be done to you and others? Well, Senator, I think we're 
we are doing that with this process. I think the F, our efforts should be focused on figuring out how these errors took place and ensuring that they don't happen again. That starts with those who committed the problem being held accountable, Senator Feinstein.